done. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated and Sunday school can be dismissed. And I need to go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to start with. Because the Lord said something to me as I was down here on the front row after I took the offering up. So we're going to look at this and then get into this message because the message is by the Spirit of God. Is God doing a work in your life? Well, I'm not criticizing you, but if he's not, it's your fault. Because it's his will. Amen. And again, as I said recently, I can't remember where I said everything that I said, but one of the messages I've been listening to is by Dr. Hagen, and he said, it's called Man and Miracles, and he said, we must find out how the Lord works and work with him. You've got to work with God. Amen. In order for God's plan to come to pass in your life. We can't know what God has said and not do it and expect fruit. We're to be doers of the word and not hearers only. But I'm going to read before I start this message in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. You know there? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, if it says let us, who's got to do it? Us. us. Let us, that's our responsibility, to lay aside every weight and the sin, which does what? So easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before you. You've got a race set before you. God's called each and every one of you to something. To accomplish something. To be somebody. Right? You've got divine appointments and anointings in this life. Do you believe that? Yes. It's true. Either way. It only works if you believe it. But let us lay aside every weight and sin which does easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Number two is extremely important as well. This is what the Lord spoke to me when I was down here. I took the offering up. And as I was taking the offering up, and I don't know who it was for, but the Lord said there's somebody or bodies here that's down on yourself. You looked at where you come from, and, and I'm talking about tithing and giving, which is rightfully so, and everything you said or thought, it was not against me to begin with. It's got nothing to do with me. This is you and God's will for your life. But you count yourself unworthy. And you say, well, that'll work for so-and-so, but it won't work for me. Just look at me. Look at who I am. Listen, God's love, God's favor, and God's mercy this morning is not based upon what you're wearing. Yeah? It's not based upon what you look like. It's not based upon your last name. It's not based upon where you come from, right? Your future is not based upon those things. This next phrase is what you must do. If you sit here, and especially this morning, but you would have obviously done it before this morning, you say, well, that, that just won't work for me, or that just won't work for us, that's wrong. You're looking at the wrong thing. What's verse 2 is what the Lord told me to tell you. He said, don't say that anymore, but you also got to change what you're looking at and focusing on. Because the only reason you're saying that is because what you're looking at. The only reason you're saying that is because what you're thinking about. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, is a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You say, why is, somebody, why is this person like they are? Because of what they focus on. Because of what they think about. Amen. You say, why is so-and-so a failure? Because they believe they are. Why is so-and-so so can't do all these things? Because they don't believe they can. You have what you say. Why do people go over instead of under? Because they believe all things are possible and believe it. Amen. That's why. Right? So what do you need to change and adjust? Verse 2 is your answer. This is what he said when I stand on the front row for whoever this is for. Don't, don't think you're being humble and noble when you belittle yourself. That's condemnation. That's not humility. And you need to think about it. When you belittle yourself and criticize yourself, you're not worth nothing. You're never going nowhere. If you are a Christian and you've made Jesus Lord of your life and you're a child of God, you're a representative of your Father. Amen. You understand that? So what you think is, no, but I, it's been years, but I used to do this stuff. I used to do these things. And the Lord corrected me one day. Even in building other people up, I would cut myself down to build other people up. And he'd say, why do you see the necessity to criticize yourself in order to put anybody else up? He said, you can encourage other people in their gift without saying anything negative about yourself. And he said, when you speak negatively about yourself being my child, it's a direct reproach on me and the Father, Jesus said. What do you need to do? Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author, see, author and finisher of our faith. The work God's begun inside of you, some of you have begun a work recently, some of you have been a work, a life work, but recently some of you is getting back in the flow in this church. This is a church of restoration. He's begun a work inside of you. You've got to keep your eyes on the right thing and the right one. You've got to look unto Jesus. Amen. There is no situation here, and I said it earlier, not for yourself, not for your marriage, not for your children. There is no situation that God cannot restore if you will not, if you will only put your trust in Him. 
if you only look to him and know that God is able. He said, I am the Lord God. Is there anything too hard for me? God said that, right? Amen. So do you believe that God's a liar or he tells the truth? So is your situation, whether I know it or not, God does, is your situation right now in line with the Bible, in reality, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, can things change? Can things turn around? Can you be who God's called you to be? 100% yes. Amen? Now, I got this by the Spirit of God. This message is important. There is a work that's been begun in many lives in this place. You're in the right place at the right time with the right people. We're seeking God together, right? Yes. And He's speaking to us to bring to pass His will in our lives. No matter where you've been, if you will listen. The Bible says in Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, you'll lead to the good of the land. Again, you've got a part to play in this, right? Some people say, well, this don't work for me. <clears throat> That's why it's not working. That's a faithless statement. It only works by faith. I've had people tell me that faith message, it don't work. Yes, it does. The faith message, the spirit of faith and the language of faith says you have what you say. You say it don't work for you and it don't work for you. So it's working while you say it don't work. If you think about it. Amen. Right? I'm giving you the word. That's Mark 11, 23 and 4. God is a God of restoration in this church. We want to see people, we're going to see people saved and healed and all those sorts of things. One of our primary purposes, if you've been here from the beginning, will be a church of restoration. We've seen this, right? Through the word and the spirit, he's going to raise up the dead and spiritually dry. And they're going to come here. The name of the church come out of John 11, 25, where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That wasn't going to be the name. Where would the name come from? The Holy Ghost and the, Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, that's what you name your church because that's my purpose. Our purpose is in the name. We're sharing the resurrection life, power, and message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? I want you to go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. I'll go ahead and give you the title, although you're going to see it in a scripture here in just a minute. But again, I'm just excited about this message. Galatians 6, 1. This is the title. This is conditional like everything else. You have to cooperate. Right? You will recover. You can't say anything different and expect to recover from your situation. Yeah. You can't. You can't say there's no way. You can't say I'm going under. You say you can't say I was born born and die for. You can't say I've had this ailment or sickness my whole life. It's just something I gotta live with and go over. Things don't change that way. Amen. We have to be people that trust God. Amen. Amen? He said you, you will recover. Is the title, but is it automatic? It's conditional. I'm ministering this by the Spirit of God, but just because I preach it to you does not mean it's going to work in your life. When you receive it and go out here and apply it and don't say what you've been saying, but say what God's saying, it'll begin to work in your life. Right? Galatians 6 verse 1 says, If a man be overtaken, brother, talking to the church, if a man be overtaken in a fall, <coughs> you which are spiritual... We run into a problem there today in the body of Christ. But there are some the spiritual. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now we give you a lot of different translations, but I'm going to give you mine this morning. What, what does it mean if a man be overtaken in a fall? What does it mean when you, somebody sins by definition? Uh, it means to miss the mark. There's many different definitions, but it means to miss the mark. So if somebody, another believer, misses the mark, Sins. We have a responsibility to yield ourselves to be vessels for God's restoration to work. And again, that's why God's placed some of you here because we're a church and a ministry of restoration for those that will receive. You're going. You already seen some, but you're going to see addiction, addicted. You're going to see people bound, people with evil spirits, people that their families have been destroyed. You're going to see all sorts of people come to this ministry and be restored. Amen. He said, "Do you believe that with every fiber of my being?" Because it's the easiest thing in the world for me to say it. It's not about me. God told me that. Amen. So I'm speaking his word. Amen. But it's not just going to happen because God told me that. It's going to happen because God told me that. And I'm speaking his word. Yeah. Right? We're word senders. Amen. Not doubt and unbelief senders. Amen. 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 To restore. You and your spiritual restore. This is what God's in the process of doing. It means to repair. To adjust or to mend. To repair, adjust, or men. It means to strengthen or perfect, to complete, 
The last one's what I wanted to get to because this is what God is doing in our lives as we renew our mind with the Word of God and put our faith in Him. To restore means to make one what He ought to be. No matter what you are today, listen to me. If you will listen to what I'm saying because it's God's Word, you can and will be who God's called you to be. You can do it. You can be the man God's called you to be. You can be the wife, God, the woman God's called you to be. Yeah, wife, uh, uh, husband. You can be the child of God. You can be who God's called you to be. You can. Amen? Don't say, I can't, I never. Yes, you can. You can. And don't wonder how. It's by Him and our faith in Him. Right? To make one, I just underlined that one was my one for today. To make one what He ought to be. Do you believe God can make you what you ought to be? You might have been hurt. You might have missed it. You might have even made bad decisions. But today is a day of restoration. And we got to go back before we go forward. Because this is what the Holy Ghost said. Go to Luke chapter 5. I've read this two or three times in the last several services. But we can look at this before I get to my scripture or passage for today. Luke chapter 5. We go on back before we go forward. Luke chapter 5 verse 1 through 11. You remember Jesus. So let's read it. Luke 5. You're going to have to put the whole of your life in his hands. You're going to have to trust him. Many of us have to have, have had to, not necessarily had to, but we did, have had to do life on our terms to realize that God knows best and we don't. Amen. Right? Many people have asked me, why do so and so and so many people have to always hit rock bottom before they ever wake up? Because they're convinced in their mind, number one, they're not the problem. Number two, that they don't, they can handle it. I can handle this. I can fix this. Now, I read, it was, it was, my gosh, it's from people 30, 40, 50 years ago. But I was reading a book about revival yesterday, and they said one of the things that we're going to have to see in the church is a revival, obviously, of trust and dependency upon God. Because it's going to be necessary for any move of God to take place. He said, but it's problematic in today's society. Because even Christians have all kinds of thousands of things they can depend on other than God. Yeah. And he said, that's what they're doing. And he said, by not depending on God, it quenches the spirit of God and God's not able to flow. He's going to have a people that's going to trust and depend on him. It's the only way he's going to be able to move in our lives. He needs our faith, right? Luke 5, 1, it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret, saw two ships. Standing by the, the lake. But the fishermen were going out of them. And were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships. Which was Simon's. Which was Peter. Simon Peter. Prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Alright. So these Peter and others have come in. They've been fishing all night. As we'll see in a minute. When's the best time to fish? So why are you going back? The Holy Ghost told me to. It's, it's, it's the best time to fish is at night. They're fishermen. Who knows better to fish than fishermen? Of course, Jesus did, but they didn't know who he was at that time. But, but at the same time, who knows better than how to fish than professional fishermen? Well, nobody. They know what they're doing. They've been to these places. They've caught fish before. They know when to fish. They know how to fish. They know how to throw their nets. They know how to do all of it. They do it probably daily, right? They've done all these things. Anybody else done all you know to do? Might have been unproductive, right? <coughs> Now, and Jesus has asked them, but while they're over here washing their nets, they're finished fishing. They were unproductive. Then the, Jesus kind of uses the, the boat to back off from the great crowd of people to minister to them, teach the word, obviously, and, and kind of like a pulpit. And, and so he can get a little distance, but still minister to everybody. And verse 4 says, when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drop. Now, what's he, see, what's he about to find out? He's about to find out whether they trust him or not. Why? Because the reality of it is... Uh, they already did what they knew was the right thing to do and it didn't work. They're tired. They'd already been unproductive in doing what they knew to do. They're tired, but now what? He tells them to do something that makes no sense. They have to choose at this point to trust him or not. They've got to make a decision. Now, a lot of people say, well, the rest of the story is awesome. They began to follow Jesus after this happened. They caught so many fish that everything busted out. It, not only could they not handle it, but their friends came, and now their boats are about to sink because they are so productive doing what makes no sense whatsoever. But what makes no sense? <clears throat> to the natural mind, what makes no sense? What is the turning point here? Is it Jesus spoke? Of course, without that, without the words of Jesus, without the words of God, we have nothing, but we have both. 
But what was the turning point in this story? They made a decision to trust the words of the master. He spoke direction that made no sense. Y'all understand that? I probably will never say that enough because the natural mind refutes the word of God. We've got to renew our mind with the word of God. Right? He told them, trust me. In so many words, launch out into the deep and, down, and let down your nets for a draw. Right? There are people in this place right now that you're in this situation. Always remember this. I say it all the time, but it's not a cute little saying. You've got to keep in mind, God knows the future better than you know the present and the past. If you are where God has placed you by divine appointment, whether it's ready in the natural or not, your next place of promotion is being prepared at this moment. It can look like nothing is changing, nothing is happening, nothing is moving. But if you are trusting God, God is moving and working on your behalf. The work he's begun inside of you, he's well able to bring to fruition and completion if you will only trust him. Remember, he said, who do they say I am? And then he asked them, he said, I want to know, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Remember in John 6, when many of them became offended at what he was teaching and preaching? Yeah, even, they even got offended and left Jesus, believe it or not. Yeah, they did. They got offended and they followed him no more because of what he was saying. And he looked to the disciples and what did he say? What are you going to do? He said, you believe too? What was he endeavoring to continually get them to do? Make your mind up and put your faith in me. Yeah. Trust me. Follow me. Can you imagine following? You ever read behind Jesus? Can you imagine following him some of the messes they got in? Can you imagine following Paul? They said, where are your leader? Oh, he's in jail. I thought God was his God. He is. He's praising him in jail. Numerous things. They beat him to death. I thought this was your leader, and it is. He never said we'd face no opposition. But even when they thought Paul was left for dead, he's raised up by the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. My God, Joseph had favor everywhere he went. No matter what they endeavored to do to him. Daniel in the lion's den, three Hebrew children. Right on down, Abraham, all the way through, all of them. They all faced problems, but they overcame all of them because they put their faith in God. Yeah. Amen. So he said, Simon answered in verse 5, answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. What, what are they saying in today's words? We've done what we do to do and we're unproductive. That's what they're saying. Right? We toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, what's nevertheless mean? In good Marian talk, even though this doesn't make any sense. We've taken nothing, nevertheless. Oh, this is underlined in parentheses, all of my Bible, so it's nevertheless. But at thy word, at thy word, whether it makes sense or not, it's not relevant. Whether it's God's word or not is relevant. I will let down thy net, the net. And when they had this done, when they did this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and the net break. They beckoned. What is that? That's the results of what? This is the results of obedience. They beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Nobody wants to sink, but this is the best reason to sink. You think about your bank account, and all about money. But how much does the FDIC insure now? Well, that's the problem you want to have with the bank. We've got to open another account somewhere because we can't put no more in here. Right? When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He realized something for sure at this moment. Jesus didn't just have a cute little message. He's Jesus. Right? When Simon Peter, we read that. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes that were taken. And you know in verse 11 it said, they, When they had brought their ships to land, what did they do? They forsook all and they followed him. So another message is very important. But they forsook all and followed him. They were still fishing, but now they were doing so with the blessing of God as a result of trusting God. Sometimes God will lead you in a completely different area, a completely different way. I'll never say no different doors would open. But I know when I was ministering to Daniel and Lindsay this past week, if God brought them back up by the Spirit of God this morning in my office, the things, some of the things that he said. 
some of the things that's going to open up for Daniel in his business and his life are going to be in a very similar field that he's been in. It might be things that wasn't there before or he didn't see before, but as they trust God together, they're going to be examples to many other people and they're going to abound with the blessings of God. And I haven't talked to him in the last little bit. So where how it is right now, I don't know. But I know what God said, and I know that's not relevant. Yeah. I know they're coming up out and over in a way they never have before. Yeah. And they're going to be an example to many. See, the devil don't let that happen. Right. It don't matter. He wants to get every one of you to give up and quit and be frustrated and discouraged and say there's no way. But see, you come to this place where just like these guys have been fishing, where you've done what you know to do and some productive. We fished all night. We worked. We worked. I've been lazy and fat at the house doing nothing. They went fishing and worked and did nothing. Call nothing. Unproductive. Doing what I know to do, but unproductive. That's not a good feeling. Right? When you laid up at the house doing nothing, you understand why you got no fruit or results. But when you go and edit and got no more fruit results than the man laying at the house, that will affect you mentally if you're not careful. You'll have to get in the Word. But when you begin to trust God, many would say, well, why would I go right back down the same path? The same reason they go right back in the same waters. Because they one time they're productive, one time they're unproductive. One time they went with the blessing of God, obeying His word. One time they went in their own strength. So you can do it in your own strength, your own way. So long as maybe you don't need God, or maybe you just don't know yet how much you need God. Some of us it took a while for us to realize how much we really need God. Amen. Like I said, I've been there and done that. A lot of times you got to do it your own way before you realize God's way is better than your way. Amen. Because you might be smart to a degree, but you're running some problems in this life that you don't have the answer to. Financially, I've told you before, our family financially, first thing, my daddy's got notes everywhere. He's in heaven now, but he'd come in any kind of financial situation with the church or anywhere in business, he was just good with all that kind of stuff and it runs through our family. And first thing he'd do is get a legal pad and get his notebook, I mean, he'd get his legal pad, get his calculator, and he'd figure it all out and all this kind of stuff, and he'd got all kind of stuff scribbled. I mean, legal, I'm not exaggerating. When he would build another church down there, he's got legal pads full of figures. Interest rates, numbers, and payments, and, and then every single thing. I mean, everything. Legal pads, pads, plural, full before he ever started in the building process. I mean, all together. But he would tell you the same thing. There will come a time and a place when you calculate or in your pencil and your legal pad, the only conclusion you come to after working for hours is that it ain't going to work. And if you haven't already, that's time to trust God because if it's his will, he'll make a way where there seems to be no way. See, this is what people don't understand. And this is by the Spirit of God this morning. You have to step first. You have to obey God first. When we started this church, many were here and you know it. We came and we leased this, this, this uh, Bible study, this Bible study building, the old Russell Stover, not the plant, but the little candy store out front that they had, somewhere across there from Jimmy B's, a little gas station. We leased that for almost a year. We leased it for a year. I think we had to. But we leased that for a year, and, and we started the Bible study. He said, I'm going to start a church here. Well, that had one office and one classroom, a couple bathrooms, and then it had a little sanctuary there for meeting. It was not, would not work for a church with Sunday school and stuff, and it wouldn't work. And he said, I'm starting a church. Well, we're telling people we're starting a church here. We don't have a church building. We have no site on a church building, had no right to anything around here, and we're just getting started even financially. So in the natural, we're saying we're going to start a church and really don't know we got a message. We really don't know how or where. And this church here, how it came about, many people know it was supernatural. God will provide when you trust him. It was, but this is the whole point. We stepped out. We started doing the Thursday night Bible study just to get our core group. We did that for almost the first year. Almost well, a whole year there, just about. And, and we did that. And we grew to 30 people, whatever it was, give or take. I don't remember. But we grew for a period of time. It was not until after we started our Bible study, after we stood up. We started in Mark 11, teaching faith. Start, after we started sending the word and did what we were supposed to do, we were contacted. Pastor Leland Harvey's on the other side now. He's in heaven. But Pastor Leland and Miss Sue that had taken this church back over in the building. We were contacted by them, and they said, we want to meet y'all. Me and Arlie were still living in Mons Corner down there. They said, we want to meet y'all, and we met them at Ryan's because it took us an hour or something to get there because we got miscommunicated on which Ryan's it was. We thought it was the one that was close, and it was way down yonder in John's Island or somewhere. And we went and sat them, and they said, God has spoken to us, and God has told us that we are not to be leaders in this next generation, but our call at this point in our life is to be a bridge. God brought us back to this church. 
They had come back and took this church over. They passed it many years ago. They come back and took this church over, and they said, we know we're not supposed to stay here. We know the church is not even supposed to grow under us. This is their words. But we're supposed to be a bridge from one generation to the next. That's what God told us about the Spirit of God. Do you know when you're trusting God, God's speaking to people on your behalf even though you don't know it? Yeah. He's working on your behalf even though you don't know it. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by feelings. We do none of that stuff when we're saying we're starting a church. We had no more right to this church than anybody else did. None. None. Pastor Hank was over in the nursing home. He was the pastor before Pastor Leland. And we're, we're going at it. And, and we're seeking God and doing all we know to do. But God said, I will provide. It's like Abraham going up the hill. Taking Isaac up to the mountain. This is his blessing. God said, give it to me. And I mean, it's not a, a calf. It's his son. The blessing that he got when he's 100 and she's 90. Bring this blood. Give it all to me. You don't lose when you give it to God. And he got up. And what did he say? His son Isaac starts asking, where's the sacrifice? What did Abraham say? What should you say? Abraham looked at his son when he saw nothing. And he said, God will provide. Do you know what God's saying to you today? Not only you will recover, God will provide if you'll trust him. Yeah, amen. amen? You're going to have to trust him in this recovery process. If you go back to doing it the way it was, you're not recovering. Yeah. Right? But we got here, and they met with us. To make a long story short, was it a, a, a Aunt Betty? Aunt, believe it or not, Aunt Betty bought the church. <laughs> she bought the whole church. I'm not going to know it. And I'll tell you how much she paid for it. Was it one or five dollars? It was one or the other. So y'all know Aunt Betty and Uncle Charlie bought the church. <laughs> I saw that on the thing. I said, we didn't give them five dollars so they had to buy the church. <laughs> you got to agree for a certain amount or whatever. But still, that, yeah. but regardless, we got the church and the land and the ground right on the beach highway and everything. They said, we're supposed to be a bridge, God told us this, from one generation to the next. Many things I've prayed about since then. And the Lord said this. He said, you got things backwards. You want to trust me after I deliver. You want to trust me after you receive. He said, that's not how it works. You trust me when you say nothing but my word. You trust me, you speak my word when you have nothing but my word. Be word senders daily, continually. We had to receive from God and speak God's word before anything appeared. You say, well, it was already here. We had no right to it and we did not own it. It was not ours. They didn't have to do anything that they did. They did it all at the instruction of the Lord. We're going to have to obey God, not just tomorrow, next month, next week, or next year. We're going to have to obey God today. We're going to have to trust God today, or we're going to stay where we're at, and it's going to get worse. Because things can get better or worse, but they're going to get better if we trust God. Oh, y'all holding me up. I'm not going to go to Luke 18 for a second time. It's time for a turnaround. Write in your Bible. Luke 18, 18 through 30. You remember this was about the rich young ruler. And he came. And he's asking Jesus, what must I have do, do, do to turn a, have eternal life and all such things? And Well, that's the only thing. He has to have eternal life. What did Jesus tell him? He said, I, the rich young ruler said, I've done not, not, not following the letter of the law because the Jews believed that what was the way to salvation? Yeah. It was obey the, the letter of the law, obey the works of the law. That's how you obtain salvation. And we know it's the opposite. Jesus has fulfilled the law. We put our faith in him to obtain salvation, right? We receive by faith. Uh, this is the gift of God's grace. But, but Jesus knew what his issue was, and what did Jesus tell him? He said, go sell all you got. Go sell all you got and give it to the poor. Maybe he said, well, i got to sell everything i got. No. He was working to a point. What was he telling him? He said, you've been doing some things. He said, but the process that you've been following will never get you what you want. Because salvation is not obtained by you doing it. It's by you trusting God. We do because we do trust God and believe in Him. We don't do good works to obtain salvation. That's not biblical. Right? We put our faith and trust in Jesus. And Jesus was telling him, it doesn't matter what all you do. You can do anything you want to. What you're doing will never get you what you want, which is an heir of eternal life. He said, and then he turned around and told him, he said, come and follow me. Why? Because Jesus is the one. That was and still is eternal life. Now our last passage today is in 1 Samuel. This is one the Holy Ghost gave me this week about uh, today in this service. And it's actually where our title comes from. 1 Samuel 29. I'm not even going to read all 
Samuel 29. We're actually going to start in 30. But in 1 Samuel 29, if we read a, a part of it, that last... Twenty nine six through eleven, there we would see that David and his men uh, they left they've left their city. Is it Ziklag? Is that how you say? They've left their city to, to go into the land of the Philistines. When they were gone, something happened. We're about to see this. What happened to David's land and his wives and his city and his family? Uh, when when him and the other uh, his army was gone, we're in First Samuel thirty verse one. We're going to see what happens here while he's gone. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, they didn't kill them, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men's over here with the Philistines while they're gone, the Malachites come into the city, take all the women and children, and burn the city down. They burnt their home down. Right? Is that a good situation? No. Verse 3. So David and his men came to the city. They're coming home now to see all this stuff. And behold, they see it. And it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. You can imagine how good that felt. Then David in verse 4. And the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. Until they had no more power to weep. They're in great distress. Right? And David's two wives were taken captives. Ahinoam, Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite, and David was greatly distressed. How do you know they were greatly distressed? The Bible says so. Because see now, of course, even the people's not happy because it's not just David's wives and family that's gone. Now, it's theirs as well. The people spake of stoning him. So what happened? Because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. So, David's took them over here with the Philistines. While he's gone, the Malachites come in, took their wives and children, burned the city down. David and these, uh, all the servant with him and the armies come back. They wanted to stone him because he's the one that led them away. He's the one that took them in the direction that caused nobody to be in the city to protect the city. And now their wives, their children, and their homes are destroyed. But what did David do? Sometimes it's what you've got to do. What's that last phrase say? Verse 6. David encouraged himself in the Lord. You know what he's doing at the beginning of the service. It's what you can do in your car, at your house, in your prayer closet. It can look bad, seem bad, even be bad. Oh, but when you begin to say, God, you're so good, your mercy endures forever. You're greater than any mountain, greater than any valley, greater than any opposition, greater than anything this yesterday or anything this to come. I put my faith and trust in you and I thank God. I'm going over and not under. I thank God. I'm the head and not the tail. I thank God. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I thank God today. I have the victory. I thank God today. I don't care what my checkbook looks like. I'm abounding with the blessings of God. The windows of heaven are opened up and the blessings of God are abounding in my life. I thank God. My conscience is clear. I thank God. I've got faith with both God and man. Oh, every time I open my mouth, you said I had the wisdom to know what to say, when to say, and how to say. I thank you that it's mine. That's how you encourage yourself in the Lord. By acknowledging every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. Not who you are in yourself. Not who other people say you are. What does God say about you? That's what you say. That's how you encourage yourself in the Lord. You can't do anything better when you get in a bad situation than look to God. Yes. Nothing better. Right? So he encouraged himself in the Lord God. Go down to verse 7. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abraham, excuse me, Abiathar, not Abraham, brought hither, thither the, the ephod, the ephod to David. In my Bible, they even got the pronunciation also. It looks like the ephod. It's, it's complicated. 
But I'm not endeavoring to give you a, a college speech this morning. We want to give you what thus saith the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen? The only thing that sets you free. Verse 8. Oh, when you get in trouble. Listen, David and them might have been over here with the Philistines where they shouldn't have been. Maybe you made some mistakes. Maybe you went in a direction you shouldn't have been. Even when you missed it, God's merciful. God will forgive you. There's no time that you shouldn't seek God. None. There's no time you shouldn't turn to God. The enemy will try to get you to think because you messed up, God's give up on you. There's no hope for you. Listen, that's the enemy talking to you. Amen. Amen. You get in the Word. One thing, another thing that'll help you in the Word of God, you'll see God use people that messed up. No, I'm not condoning sin, but it's a reality. People missed it. They messed up, and God used them mightily when they turned back to Him. Amen. Amen. But He said, David inquired uh, at the Lord, saying, "Shall I pursue this truth?" Oh, we're about to get our definitions and message and everything for today. Shall I pursue this truth? After this truth, shall I overtake them? He goes to God in the middle of his mess. And he answered him. He answered him. God answered him. God didn't say, well, you didn't do what I told you. I'm going to talk to you. He said, well, I sinned and I need to make it right. I asked God to forgive you. And he'll forgive you. Yes. Definitely. Make it right. But, but go to God. He answered him. This is what God told him. He said, pursue. Does that sound like quit? Does that sound like give up? Does that sound like walk out here and let them stone you because it's your fault anyways? Hmm? <coughs> many people say, and you do reap what you sow if you don't repent. But many people say, you made your bed and you got to lay in it. My God, repent. Don't lay down. <laughs> don't lay in it. Don't jump in it. Repent. Amen. Repentance is a gift from God. Yes, he said, I've been wrong. Repent. Amen. Say, Pastor, when's the last time you repented before I come out here? You say, you've done any grave sin? Not that I'm aware of, but I still make sure my heart's right before I get there. I say daily, Lord, anything I've said, done, or thought wrong, I ask you to forgive me in Jesus' name. Anything I haven't done that I should have done, I ask you to forgive me and show it to me so I can get it right. In Jesus' name. Amen? Because you may be perfect already in every way, shape, form, or fashion, but you're still working on me. Right? He answered him, pursue. This is what God told David when he saw him. For thou shalt over, surely overtake them, and without fail, he said, you're going to recover a little bit of it. No, this is not just something I found this cute. This is what the Holy Ghost led me to and said to tell you this day, you, he has started a work of restoration in your life, and to walk by faith and not by sight, it does not matter what it looks like, seems like, or feels like. This word today that was spoken from God to David is spoken by God through me to you today. He is saying, get up and pursue, and surely you're going to overtake every single thing the enemy endeavors to place in your life, and without fail, you're going to recover all. There's preachers everywhere that's telling you, if you give you a $58 seed, you're going to have $5,800 next week. I don't never say that kind of stuff because I don't believe it's true. I believe that's hooking and crooking. But what I'm telling you today is directed by the Spirit of God. He said, get up and pursue. You're going to overtake them. Everything the enemy's got to destroy you. If you'll trust God and without fail, you're going to recover all. Now, after God spoke these words, after he's encouraged himself in the Lord, look what happened. So David, in verse 9, he went. <coughs> verse 9. David went, he and his 600, and the 600 men that were with him came to the brook Besor, where, they, where, they, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued. Why did he pursue? Because God said pursue. Yeah. Do what he says. It'll work. David pursued he and 400 men. Oh, there's a message there too. For 200 abode behind, which was so faint that they could not go over. The brook be sore, and they, what, what's, what, what's happened here? David has been assured success. Even when he stepped out to obey the word that he got from God, he had 600 men with him. 200 because of being physically exhausted from what they had already been doing, and from three days' journey, they couldn't go with them. You got 600 going after you've heard from God. One third of them can't go. That is not a confidence booster. Yeah. It's not. When you step out to obey God, is it true that ultimately everything will fall in place? Yes. 
But is it true in the process of time in this earth, you will have to walk by faith because you're going to have times it looks like nothing's falling in place? Yes. You have to speak the word only even when the word is the only thing you have and see. And it will work. Amen? So 200 out of the 600 can't go a third of And this is what God did, though. Verse 11. They found an Egyptian in the field as they're headed this way to where the Amalekites are. And they brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water. Oh, there's divine appointments ahead for you. Yeah. There is. This guy here, it's a little nobody. He's sick. He's ailing. So his master of the Amalekites has left him behind to die in the field. But he had a purpose. He had a purpose. You may think you're a little old nobody. God's got a purpose for you. Yeah. God's got a plan for you. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I can't count all the stories in the Bible where people, it looked like total failure. You go back to Peter and those in the boat, it looked like total failure, and they obeyed the word of the Lord. Did it just bless them? Did it just bless them? No. Can you imagine the witness when all their friends came? They trusted Jesus. They took his word. All his friends came and couldn't contain the catch. They didn't even trust Jesus at that time. They didn't believe in God at that time. But they come, and what happened? Can you imagine when they got so much, catching all this stuff, when you ain't supposed to catch nothing, and then all Peter had to say, you might want to listen to that guy right there. Yeah. You might want to listen to him, because this is why we got this hall today. Yeah. We said, how are we going to build the kingdom of God? Start with you. Start with me. Don't be a naysayer. Amen. Trust God. Yes. Don't bring a reproach on the kingdom of God. Speak the word only. Amen. What has he said? Amen. They gave him a piece of cake. A piece of a cake of figs. Two clusters of raisins. If y'all don't bribe me with anything, don't bring that. <laughs> a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, you better bring me a ribeye. When he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. Oh, God is a God of reviving and restoration. For he had eaten no bread, nor drunk any water. Three days and three nights he's left there to die. Verse 13, David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? Who do you belong to? And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago I was, I fell sick. You may be somebody that to others you're no value. But God's got not only himself, but other people that need what you got. Yeah. Others may have left you out in the field, but don't feel sorry for yourself. Yeah. Trust God because somebody needs you and the God that lives inside of you. Hallelujah. God, Chris, why well, I can't stand to hear Christians pouting and whining and complaining. Your fat mouth is your problem. Yeah. Shut it up. Yeah. Stop doing it. Yeah. Don't blame other people. Amen. Stop. You say, why do you keep saying that? Because there's people here that if you shut up, your life will be better. Daddy used to say, if you don't have nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. Amen. People that speak negativity, doubt, and unbelief all the time, nobody else is their problem. They are. You are having what you say. And you are repellent to everybody. Nobody wants to hear that. People have enough problems already without being torn down further. They don't need it. Nobody does. They need to hear the truth of God's word. You can be who God's called you to be. You can do what God's called you to do. You can step out and trust him and see what God's called you to see. And no matter how insignificant you see today, stop looking at yourself and see yourself in Christ Jesus. You are so valuable to Father God that he gave his only begotten son yeah. to die, to give you everlasting yeah. eternal life. You are of great value. Yeah. Don't let anybody, including yourself or the devil, tell you any different. Amen? Amen? We do things sometimes. Think, oh, this is so. This, I just, I'm just, I'm just, I can't do this. And nobody loves me. Well, I mean, it sounds good. And you might get people to feel sorry for you. Well, I'll be honest with you. You're a liar. Amen. Somebody loves you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. The reality of it, you're probably deceived. Because there's people in the earth that love you. Yeah. But while you're wallowing, you're not speaking the word of God. And you'll never come out of the problem, that boy. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Right? Yeah. God's got a plan for you. Because three days ago I fell sick. 14. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites. And upon the coast which belongeth to Judah. And upon the south of Caleb. And we burned Ziglag with fire. He was there during all this time. 
You be careful who you chunk over to the side. They let this guy give me that scripture in Proverbs 26 over there to the pitch you did for somebody else is the one you're going to fall on yourself. That's right. right? He said, I'm going to get them. You done, done got God. Mm-hmm. It's the worst truth because you reap what you sow. So they left this guy behind here. He said, I was there when they burned your city down. And David said to him, can you bring me to this company? Mm-hmm. See, these guys, when they left him behind to die, they didn't know he was going to be the guy right. for David and his people. Mm-hmm. Right? Canst thou bring me to this company? He said, swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me. He done got a bad hand. <laughs> David swear to me by God. Nor deliver me into the hands of my master. And I'll bring you to this company. Divine appointments and play. Oh, there's so many messages in this this, this morning. Verse 16. I'm not going to read the whole thing even, so don't get scared. But this is good stuff. Yes. When he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing. So what they're doing? They're celebrating the spoils of their destruction of other people. They're having a party. Right? And they're caught off guard. Eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoils they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. See, some of you lost some things. You trust God, you're going to recover. And there are some. I'm not even just, I'm not, he knows I ain't trying, I never do this. I'm not trying to point just Daniel about the Holy Ghost helping me about Daniel and them all this morning. There are some, and I do not know their present state. Their best is yet to come if they trust God. But there's other people out here. It's not just in the business realm. You're going to increase as you trust God. You're going to increase. You give them greater credit and glory than you ever have before. There's restoration in every area you can recover if we trust God. Amen. Always be sure to make sure your testimony is that I put my faith in him and he saw me through. Give God the glory. So David smote them, 17, smote them from the twilight even unto evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. What did God say? He told David to pursue, and you're going to recover everything you lost. What does it say in verse 18? David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and he rescued his two wives. I'm not sure if that's good or not, but still, he rescued his two wives. <laughs> if you got two today, you might just need to rescue one. You don't need but one. <laughs> Under the new covenant, you just need one. <laughs> Verse 19, and just one husband. You don't need two of either one. Verse 19, this is a Holy Ghost message. He recovered all, in parentheses, underline, and stars in my Bible. And there was nothing lacking. God can restore everything you've lost plus more if you would trust him. You can recover. Don't say you can't anymore. There was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither small, nor anything that they had taken to them. It says again, all marked up in my Bible, David recovered all because God said so. David believed it. David acted on it. And it was just as God said. Even when a third of his army couldn't go with him, it happened just like God said it would happen. David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. Spoil is gain. Spoil is increase. God is a God of increase. Last scripture today, Ephesians 3 verse 20. He is a God of increase, you say, is increase God's will for my life? Yes, in every single area. If it's not increased, don't speak it. If the enemy's working overtime in your life, you say, I thank God I've been given authority, Mr. Devil, over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. I'm to resist you steadfast in the faith. Thanks be unto God. Submit myself unto God. I resist the devil and he'll flee. I command you to take your hands off my money. Take your hands off my body. Take your hands off my children. Take your hands off my finances in Jesus' name. I choose to follow the Holy Spirit and live by the word. Amen. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says. Y'all there? All this is good, these Ephesians prayers. But the Bible says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Exceedingly abundantly. Above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that works in us. We've got to take this word. Obey this word and trust God. 
and he will do exceedingly abundantly above anything we can ever think or imagine. But if you go out of here and begin to speak negativity, doubt and unbelief, every way you've been puffed up today, or encouraged is a better word, every way you're going to deflate yourself again. You'll be deflated. We're going to speak the word. And don't just say, I can. People's into all this positivity and positive attitude stuff. It's ignorant. It's nothing. It's not faith. It's not of God. Right? I, I'm not just going to be saying, oh, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. You run into a lot of failures saying, I can do it. You say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Our faith is not in self. Saying, I can do it, and say, I can do all things through Christ is not even similar. It's opposites. Total dependencies. Different dependencies. Saying, I can do it is dependent upon me. Saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and my God is my supply, is put my faith in Him. Those are not the same thing. We're not talking about you and magnifying you this morning. We're talking about you and I putting our faith in God Almighty. Stand to your feet. Father, <coughs> we come before you in Jesus' name. We love you so much and thank you for this day and many blessings. Thank